Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for coming back to with me to Tom Navolis here at the uh, Liberty Works Radio Network for Samuel Adams Returns, the Anti-Federalist Got It Right. Uh, today, I, I have to say that I, I've even begun differently. And I do want to thank those who are regular listeners, and especially I want to thank any first-time listeners. I really appreciate you joining in and listening to what we talk about here on this program in particular relative to the mirrors of history as it pertains to the here and now. And I'm very sober-minded, as I have been over the last several weeks, in that uh, we lost a great man last Saturday as this program was uh, aired. Uh, We discovered that uh, our good friend, uh, Justice uh, Antonin Scalia, uh, has departed us. Uh, The question in mind uh, definitely is that his family is doing well. Uh, Kathy and I had the great privilege of uh, listening to Justice Scalia uh, out on Long Island at the Federalist Society where he came and spoke, and it was just a a fabulous uh, time to hear this great constructive, constitutional constructive uh, justice. And uh, I guess you could take and go down the conspiracy road if you so desire. There are a lot of questions regarding his passing, and I'll let you go search that on the Internet. But the critical component of what we face today is not only tied into this election process, but it is also tied critically into what is going to happen and be manipulated by this dictator-in-chief in office uh, in, in trying to turn the court into a generational shift that really, if the person is young enough, will affect two generations, if not more. Um, we already have seen what type of person that he is willing to appoint to the court in the justice that he did, and she is everything contrary to what our founders believed. Uh, you can go research her in a time of her appointment. I, I did such and uh, read her articles, her papers, her dissertations, and uh, then looked into her lifestyle. And she is absolutely contrary to everything that our founders intended for this nation. So we can only suspect that uh, this uh, sitting usurper, again, a elected usurper, and I should say that correctly, is that he is a, a sitting elected tyrant, in that when you look at uh, the 5,000-year leap, which I was happened to be listening today uh, as I was driving, I have the, I have the audio book of that, and while I was uh, driving from one location to the other today, I was listening to the 5,000-year leap, and they were explaining tyranny. And as Dr. Skousen had talked about that balance of power, uh, the balance of what it means for good governance, uh, tyranny is what our founders were absolutely against. They were against anarchy and they were against tyranny. And uh, they defined tyranny as that great uh, uh, abusive and excessive government. And that's what was brought in uh, with the uh, 08 election in particular, was the increase of government to such an extent that it is overbearing and overreaching in so many different ways. And when items were being taken to the Supreme Court, because as we well know that a sitting president has every right and wherewithal to appoint justices uh, throughout the various districts uh, in the federal court system, that uh, we have seen from the several years of these lifetime appointments, the uh, debacle that we have today in uh, injustice, in perversion, in uh, not a clear rule of law as our founders intended. And, and this is what uh, Justice Scalia brought. He brought the construct, as he said, he was a strict construct constitutionalist or a construct constitutionalist 
going back to what the anti-federalists, and I have to say in, in some instances, or let me reverse that, what the Federalists wrote, and in some instances, what the Anti-Federalists were talking about. Which brings me to a very uh, simple uh, commentary on that, is that uh, I went and I looked at the various Federalist papers, and I'm not going to get exhaustive in here, but uh, when, when you go in and you look at the question of the judiciary, we can look at just Brutus number 1, in, in what it had to say, and uh, when it was talking about you know what the, the intent and the arguments that were going on was how should this government be formed? And one of the things that uh, the pseudonym Brutus wrote was that this government is to possess absolute and uncontrollable power, legislative, executive, and judicial, with respect to every object to which it extends for by the last clause of Section 8, Article 1, it is declared, quote, that the Congress shall have power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States or in any department or office thereof, end quote. Uh, that's interesting. So this is, you know, as we see what the Obama administration has done in particular, they clearly, as a uh, so-called law professor, what we have is that the enemy understands the Constitution way better than any one of the majority of the legislators sitting in Congress. And on top of that, uh, he, the enemy understands it way better than the average citizen to whom we are supposed to understand it, to whom all the elected are supposed to answer. And yet we don't even understand that very simple clause of Section 8, Article 1, as it can be manipulated and what it would mean from the whole perspective of the judiciary. Uh, I'm going to take you through a couple other areas, and I may um a lot because I'm going to be jumping potentially from one article to the other, uh, and and we hear in the background the police state in action. Hopefully, it's for the benefit of someone's safety. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the things that continued on in Brutus uh, was a commentary relative to the judiciary. And this, again, he was talking about where's that liberty? How does that destruction of liberty in a consolidation of power in the government, uh, as, however, dwell upon these, being the destruction of liberty with uh, wars, armies, the sins upon the judicial power of this government, in addition to the proceedings, will for the United States is to be vested in a Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as Congress may from time to day and establish. The powers of these courts are very extensive, such as arise between citizens of the same state, and it extends to one inferior court must be established, and I presume in each state, at least, with the necessary executive officers appendant thereto. It is easy to see that in the common course of things, these courts will eclipse the dignity and take away from the respectability of the state courts. These courts will be, in themselves, totally independent of the states, deriving their authority from the United States and receiving from them fixed salaries. And in the course of human events, it is to be expected that they will swallow up Ladies and gentlemen, this is a lot of what we have been seeing uh, within the courts, within how they have been consuming uh, the, the, what's going on in the states. And then it goes to how does the federal courts rule then on that which should be Ninth and Tenth Amendment issues, which then are relieved to the states and to the people we're seeing what the anti-federalists predicted. I want to jump real quick over to the anti-federalist papers that were written by the Pennsylvania minority. Attended the uh, Constitutional Convention, but had a contrary position uh, to, the, to that uh, stated Constitution. 
And one of the things that they brought out, and again, this was relative to Pennsylvania in itself, and this was the arguments that they were bringing to Pennsylvania as they was going through the uh, process of ratifying the Constitution. And, and I quote now from the Pennsylvania minority. It says, the judicial powers vested in Congress are also so various and extensive that by legal ingenuity they may extend to every case and thus absorb the state judiciaries. And when we consider the decisive influence that a general judiciary would have over the civil polity of the several states, we do not hesitate to pronounce that this power, unaided by the legislative would affect a consolidation of the states under one government. Uh, my friends, this is a lot of what has been going on. And, and Justice Scalia was the, the, the break point there. He would dissent in so many different ways. He would write, uh, either be able to write opinions of uh, assent or dissent, depending on where the case went. Uh, one of the things, again, he understood that the judiciary did not have the right to impede the states and maintained always that there are states' rights and that the Constitution was a glue to hold the states together but not a force to obviate the states and to take over as a centralized government. But as we've seen, and as we've already read in Brutus, the potentials for the federal government to totally do exactly that is to obviate the states in so many instances, all the way down to your bathroom, if you will, as Samuel Adams wrote about. It just gets to that point of, my goodness gracious, who are we going to find that is going to replace Justice Scalia. The Justice Thomas, uh, he's not as strong. He's very opinionated. He's the closest next thing that we have. Roberts, we know uh, in so many ways. I, I, I wonder, I guess from a conspiratorial perspective, if you will, uh, what does the Obama administration and the globalists have over Justice Roberts uh, based on some of the decisions that he's made over the last several years? And uh, I don't know. You know. This is what history will maybe reveal in time and maybe never reveal in time. But ladies and gentlemen, we have to understand that the court, ever since the time of Thomas Jefferson, which we'll talk about Thomas Jefferson in the next couple of segments, in, in a very interesting way, um, that Thomas Jefferson warned about the courts. He actually had a very difficult time with the Marshall Court. Uh, and he understood that there could be, and he states very clearly, the potentials for judicial tyranny, the overreach of the judiciary, which brings me back slightly to the Pennsylvania minority where they comment in their letter is that the power of the court of equity vested by this Constitution in the tribunals of Congress, powers which do not exist in Pennsylvania. So he's talking about, hey, you know, all of a sudden, this court, and even in Congress itself, has powers that they never had in Pennsylvania. Unless so far as they can be incorporated with a jury trial would, and that's where the equity court came into play, was with the jury trial, in this state, greatly contribute to this event. The rich and wealthy suitors would eagerly lay hold of the infinite maze, perplexities, and delays which a court of chancery, with the appellate power of the Supreme Court in fact as well as law, would furnish him with, and thus a poor man being plunged in a bottomless pit of legal discussion would drop his demand in despair." Ladies and gentlemen, we have seen this over and over, except, you know, to the extent that I've seen one of the primary candidates who has taken and been able to argue before the Supreme Court successfully. So as we come back, you have to think about who will best select the next justice or justices as we move into a new presidency. Come on back. It's Samuel Adams' return. The Anti-Federalists got it right 
here on Liberty Works Radio Network. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Samuel Adams Returns. The Anti-Federalist Got It Right here on Liberty Works Radio Network with your host, Tom Navolis. Once again, I thank you for being here with me as we uh, honor Justice Scalia and the great constitutional constructionist uh, that he was and that he was a stalwart in the court in trying to keep the framework of our liberties held together within the construct of the Constitution. That's why he was a constitutional constructionist. Now, uh, we have to honor him for that, and that now we have a great gap. And one of the primary things that have has been in the discussion this week, and should be for anyone that's going to make a decision, is who will be that person to take and, uh, what, select maybe more than one justice. Obviously, the necessity to fill uh, Justice Scalia's position is paramount. And we know that uh, this present administration is intent on putting forward, once again, one of their um, change agents, one that will fulfill what the Anti-Federalist had said, in respect to the powers of the judiciary. And what I would like to take you to is a writing, once again, of uh, that pseudonym, Brutus, uh, 31st of January, 1788. And he focuses, and, I, and I've done this in other programs. I brought to the, this focus to you, and I want to just bring it again because it's so critical at this point in history. This is looking back over time and seeing what the intent was and that uh, it, there, there, it was prophetic in so many different ways as to what might occur, and we see it actually happening. So written on uh, 31st of January, 1788, we hear Brutus in this article writing, The nature and extent of the judicial power of the United States proposed to be granted by this Constitution claims our particular attention. Much has been said and written upon the subject of this new system on both sides, but I have not met with any writer who has discussed the judicial powers with any degree of accuracy. And yet it is obvious that we can from but very imperfect ideas of the manner in which this government will work or the effect it will have in changing the internal policy and mode of distributing justice at present subsisting in the respective states. Now, i got to stop there for a second, because obviously they're looking at this great experiment. And one of the things that they're talking about here, very simply, is what we've heard over the last eight years in particular, uh, a change, this change agent. And... The, the judicial power, as Brutus is bringing out in this letter, is going to affect the internal policies and mode of distributing justice all the way down into the states. This is what we have seen. We have seen over and over in these last eight years state courts living under constitutional state and federal constitutional right to adjudicate cases, in particular that of, uh, let's see, the the, the uh, homosexual mirage, as my good friend or good pastor, uh, uh, associate friend uh, says, is that it is a mirage, anything to do with the, the sodomites and the homosexual idea of... Uh, their common destruction of uh, God's intent for marriage. So he calls it a mirage. I love that. And we see that the federal judiciary has overstepped its boundaries and claimed a a, um, judicial prerogative over the states. So this is where it's disturbing the justice at present subsisting in the respective states. Without a thorough investigation of the powers of the judiciary and of the manner in which they will operate. This government, talking about this new constitution, is a complete system, not only for making, 
but for executing laws. And the courts of law, which will be uh, constituted by it, are not only to decide upon the Constitution and the laws made in pursuance of it, but by officers subordinate to them to execute all their decisions. The real effect of this system of government will therefore be brought home to the feelings of the people through the medium of the judicial power. Ladies and gentlemen, we're we're seeing that with what? Bakers, photographers, uh, you know, uh, flower shops, that what we're seeing is that the effect of the government system, of this system, will be brought home to the feelings of the people through the medium of judicial power. This is what Brutus was talking about. This is what we're seeing. This is what we're experiencing in a number of various states, all the way down to the individual. Sam Adams talked about that again. He spoke of that a number of different times. And so to examine it, it is, moreover, of great importance to examine with care the nature and extent of the judicial power, because those who are to be vested with it are to be placed in a situation altogether unprecedented in a free country. They are to be rendered totally independent, both of the people and the legislature both with respect to their office and salaries. No errors may they may commit can be corrected by any power above them, if any such power there be, nor can they be removed from office for making ever so many erroneous adjudications. Ladies and gentlemen, that's why the whole idea of selecting an executive the whole idea of placing the proper senators that have moral, foundational, constitutional understanding, both from the Federalist perspective and even more so from the Anti-Federalist perspective. Now, I'm not going to endorse any candidate, but one thing that I will say is that there is only one individual that I have researched to this point who has studied the Federalist and Anti-Federalist papers since he was nine years old, and that only one person has successfully argued many cases before the Supreme Court, not only for the state in which he lived and was appointed uh, within, but one that Uh, He worked in a law firm that he argued cases before the Supreme Court and won. He won his cases. There's only one candidate in the running that understands the value and the construct of the Constitution as well as the value and the construct of the Supreme Court and its nature and operation to the extent that we need to get the right justice on there. And ladies and gentlemen, I can continue to go on and on and on and on about the court, but in respect to Justice Scalia, I'm going to leave that at this time, and I'm going to segue into what I was just uh, mentioning uh, in, in, in some respect, the idea of what is going on uh, in, uh, I, I have to tell you, it's interesting. Uh, people are saying, oh, wow, uh, we, we have all of this more than rhetoric. We have a, um, what do you want to call it? We, we want to say we have this media system that is uh, trying to, on one hand, uh, elevate the socialist communist on the democrat side, and then on the other side is to actually add a flame and fuel to the fire of what is going on on the, the Reputican side. And I used those names and I created those names many, many years ago that uh, we, we have the Democrats uh, because they have been given over to uh, the enemy and the, you know that was one of the goals of the Communist Party, as, as I've said before, is to take over uh, the uh, uh, one or both uh, of the political parties. But more so, it is also in there is that their goal was to utilize the judicial system 
to destroy our Constitution. And what we have helping us is that the media is creating this massive insanity of uh, what's happening out there and, and what we see and, and the ugliness, if you will, of uh, what's going on in, in the campaigns. And here's something that I think you'll find very interesting, that nasty political mudslinging campaign attacks and counterattacks, personal insults. We're having lots of personal insults. Outrageous newspaper invective, dire predictions of warfare, and even national collapse. Innovative new forms of politicking, capitalizing on a growing technology. We're seeing a lot of that. And you know something? Here's what it comes down to. As much as this seems to describe this present day presidential contest, it actually describes an election more than 200 years past. You getting that? That this outrageous activity, this mudslinging, this name calling, this activity is actually describing an election more than 200 years ago. Ladies and gentlemen, what I want to bring to your attention is the presidential election of 1800 was an angry, dirty, crisis-ridden contest that seemed to threaten the nation's very survival. These emphatic statements that uh, I've been making, quite frankly, are from an article that was written in History Now, the journal of the Gilder uh, Learman Institute, and it is called The Presidential Election of 1800, A Story of Crisis, Controversy, and Change by Joanne B. Freeman. And she wrote those opening statements, and she did a very good investigative reporting on what was known as what? Uh, yeah, the election of 1800. But in uh, that election of 1800, it was actually called a revolution in that, called it somewhat of a revolution. You see, that was the election uh, between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. And it was a, a very emotional, a very hard-fought campaign, and each side believed that victory by the other would ruin the nation. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're in that same predicament today. We know that, without a question, the Democrats have socialists, and their agenda has been such, especially under this president administration, that it is absolutely contrary to anything, even those that were uh, arguing and contentious during this 1800 uh, campaign, it, 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 it is more determinant of what happens in this election because we are absolutely up against a takeover of pure communist socialist insanity throughout our whole nation versus some semblance of reconstructive uh, republicanism. And I don't mean the Republican Party. What I do mean is the principles of a Republican idea. Now, what was happening at that period of time is that uh, the candidates themselves never went out and actually uh, campaigned. It was all done uh, through the chaos of the media, through uh, uh, surrogates, uh, through others, uh, to the extent that, uh, you know, we have things that are going on today that I'll come back to in the next segment that I'm wondering. What I heard today and what the uh, Pope had said about uh, Mr. Trump, uh, I'm going to bring out to you here in a little bit what was uh, said about a different candidate during that period of time and by whom it was said. And the format, the, the, the focal point here is that the mudslinging and contention is nothing new in politics. But ladies and gentlemen, what we have to understand, who are the people of principles? And when we come back, what I'm going to do is discuss with you some of the rest of the ideas of what happened in that election of 1800, who were the principal parties, uh, what were they arguing about, and uh, what changed. 
So come on back to Samuel Adams Returns, the Anti-Federalist Got It Right, here on Liberty Works Radio Network, where liberty works for you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to Samuel Adams Returns, the Anti-Federalist Got It Right, here on Liberty Works Radio Network with your host, Tom Novolis, as this week we are taking the time to honor uh, and uh, give a great thank you to Justice Scalia who passed and in the consideration of who will be the uh, best candidate out there that will be able to um, select a justice that can fill the large shoes of Justice Scalia. And one thing that I didn't mention in any of the other segments that I'd like to just briefly, briefly mention is that uh, we're going to wait and see if this uh, so-called uh, Republican Senate will take and give in to the likes of uh, this uh, sitting president, this lame duck sitting president, and give him a vote on his uh, potential judicial appointment. Uh, my opinion would be no. Don't even give the man the consideration, even with the fact, and especially with the fact that this president will not attend Justice Scalia's funeral. So why in the world would the Republican uh, Senate even consider to take and allow this man's potential nomination to come before the Judiciary Committee? I think that they are a bunch of political weenies and have no intestinal fortitude whatsoever to stand against the attacks, the enemy of this nation who was duly elected, duly elected, we duly elected an enemy of this nation. And uh, this, uh, and, and uh, okay, I'll give you a break. The, these Republican Senate, well, they have the intestinal fortitude to stand up against this um, enemy of the state. All right, with that, let's get back to what I was talking about in the last um, segment of the Revolution of 1800. Did you know that that's what that was called? It was called the Revolution of 1800. And the reasons that it was a revolution was because this was the first time that two parties actually vied for uh, the, the greatest office uh, in the planet, the presidency. We had always that establishment of the Federalist and the so-called Anti-Federalist. People knew that. Uh, but here, what was coming about in this whole period of, of what, uh, 1800 would be about 97, 98 that would be 1797 and 1798, that we had a uh, new party coming about that was called nothing other than, what? The Democratic Republican Party, which was part of what uh, Thomas Jefferson was. So the interesting thing that I brought out was how vicious, how vicious the media was, how vicious uh, others were, and again, the two candidates themselves did not go out and campaign. There was everyone else that would go out and campaign for them. Uh, so you talk, that was very interesting uh, and to that effect and how that all came about. So we just came off eight years of George Washington. Uh, John Adams, he was, you know, kind of an interesting character. Uh, Samuel Adams' cousin. John Adams was nothing like his cousin. And, and actually, they were contrary in their positions, being John, John Adams as a Federalist and Samuel Adams as a staunch Anti-Federalist. So when you start looking at what was going on in that whole uh, idea of who was vying for the power, and that the political power, and that's what our uh, founders understood, and which is brought out in the 5,000-year leap, it is not about political systems. It is not about political parties. It is not about that distribution of one party over the other, but it is about political power. 
And who holds that political power? And how does that function? And how is it supposed to be in that middle ground that our founding fathers intended? So if you have not read the 5,000-year leap and you want a very good digest on uh, how our nation should function, I highly recommend uh, that you go out and get a copy of that and, and read it. So back to this uh, revolution of 1800 and uh, what was happening there. As we saw today, which was very, very interesting to me, was that the Pope on the Mexican side of the U.S. border, uh, he called uh, Donald Trump uh, not a Christian. Interesting. In 1800, the Federalists attacked Jefferson as an unchristian deist whose sympathy for the French Revolution would bring a similar bloodshed and chaos to the United States. So here we have this pope that was saying that, uh, that, that, that Donald Trump wasn't a Christian and that he was going to cause all sorts of problems for all of these insurgents that are coming in across our border. Uh, Trump uh, in, in his own way, he had a very interesting response. Overall, what we saw in 1800 is that the Federalists were going on their position and uh, the Democrat Republicans were taking and uh, maintaining their position relative to the arguments that uh, they were bringing forth from uh, their, 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 their context and understanding of the Constitution and how it should function. The article that I was mentioning before out of uh, Gilder is uh, extremely good. I, I would highly recommend that you uh, Google that article from the Gilder uh, Lehman, uh, dot org, and I may put a reference to it in the archives or in the promo. I think I'll do that because I think it's a very interesting article, and I may put all of these um, references here for you to go take a look at. So uh, the question in that particular article is why is there so little scholarship uh, in, in particular around this, um, this election? Well, there's little scholarship, if, if, if you really understand it, about anything to do with our founding era and what happened in that first uh, 15 to 20 years. It's amazing the changes. It's amazing that what we saw here is that the... Uh, Democratic Republicans, which were simply called then the Republicans, and the Federalists were not parties as we now understand them, uh, as an institutionalized two-party system uh, would look like in, in, in today. They just weren't that. But what they were were the ideas uh, that would come together and, and that would transpire in such a way that history was actually changed. And we saw also then in the 2008 election, history was changed for America. And it was changed in the same way that we brought this uh, uh, socialist jihadist into office, and many people didn't understand that. They, they never vetted this person to the extent that they would, and it goes to the fact that I say that the Democrat Party is a party system, and that party system is controlled to the extent that now uh, we have... Uh, I, I think that's interesting here is this article is saying uh, political parties were not an accepted part of the picture of the day. Instead, they were viewed as illicit groups of self-interested men intent on winning power and position in the next election. Well, that didn't change. I don't know that they're illicit groups, but in many respects they are. I mean, you look at what they did, poor old Bernie Sanders, of all people. You talk about getting jacked over with the with, with that whole process that happened in New Hampshire. Yeah, there's a little Ill Ill illicit stuff going on in there. And definitely what we know is that from a party perspective, and what we see today, it is exactly self-interested men and women that are intent on doing what? Winning elections, grabbing the hold of that power. And, uh, you know, that's that's just a key element of what uh, was going on. So in, in, in the whole uh, aspect of this, what we're trying to do is how do you maintain the republic? That is always the question. How do you maintain the republic? And before I get too much further 
into that and, and, and focus on that, ladies and gentlemen, because that is the same question today. Which candidate will help maintain the republic today, especially as our founders intended? Well, I want to get back and finish off a little bit here with what uh, Samuel Adams wrote uh, to uh, Thomas Jefferson. Samuel Adams is retired. He's in the twilight of his life. It's about a year before he dies. Uh, and so, and this was uh, written by him, uh, Boston, April 24th, 1801. This is after uh, uh, Jefferson won the election. And he says, uh, Jefferson wrote to Adams, and so Adams is responding to that. And, and here's what he says. My very dear friend, your letter of the 29th of March came duly to my hand. I sincerely congratulate our country on the arrival of the day of glory, which has called you to the first office and administration of our federal government. Your warm feeling of friendship must certainly have carried you to a higher tone of expression than my utmost merits will bear. If I have uh, at any time been avoid or frowned upon, your kind ejaculation in the language of the most perfect friend of man surpasses every injury. The storm is now over, and we are in a port, and I dare say the ship will be rigged for her proper service. She must also be well manned and very carefully officered. No man can be fit to sustain an office who cannot consent to the principles by which he must be governed. With you, I hope we shall once more see harmony restored, but after so severe a long storm, it will take the proportionate time to still the raging of the waves." The world has been governed by prejudice and passion, which never can be friendly to truth. And while you nobly resolve to retain the principles of candor and of justice resulting from a free, elective, representative government, such as they have been taught to hate and despise, you must depend upon being hated yourself because they hate your principles. Not a man of them dare openly to despise you. Your inaugural speech, to say nothing of your eminent service to the acceptance of our country, will secure you from contempt. It may require some time before the great body of our fellow citizens will settle in harmony, good humor, and peace. When deep prejudices shall be removed in some, the self-interestedness of others shall cease, and many honest men, whose minds for want of better information have been clouded, shall return to the use of their own understanding. The happy and wished-for time will come. The eyes of the people have too generally been fast closed from the view of their own happiness. Such, alas, has been always the lot of man. But providence, who rules the world, seems now to be rapidly changing the sentiment of mankind in Europe and America. May heaven grant that the principles of liberty and virtue, truth and justice, may pervade the whole earth. I have a small circle of intimate friends, among whom Dr. Charles Jarvis is one. He is a man of much information and great integrity. I hardly wish there may be an epistemology correspondence between him and you. I should have written this letter before, but not my faithful friend and amusist, John Avery, who is your friend as well as mine, been occupied in the business of his office as secretary of this commonwealth, which was Massachusetts, which he attends with great punctuality and integrity. It is in my power, dear friend, to give you counsel. An old man is apt to flatter himself that he stands upon an equal footing with younger men. He indeed cannot help feeling the powers of his mind as well as his body are weakened, but he relies upon his memory and fondly wishes his young friend to think that he can instruct them by his experience, when all probability is he forgot every trace of it. That was worth his memory. Be assured that my esteem for you is as cordial, if possible, as yours is to me. 
Though an old man cannot advise you, he can give you his blessing. You have devoutly my blessing and my prayers. Ladies and gentlemen, the words of Samuel Adams as we leave this day in remembering Mr. Our Justice, dear friend Scalia. Come on back next week to Samuel Adams Returns, the Anti-Federalist Got It Right, here on Liberty Works Radio Network. Network. Network.